What's up, y'all? I'm always here with the theater picks Chicagoans cannot stop talking about, and I got another show I want to put on y'all radar. Steppenwolf presents the world premiere of Purpose. It's a play about a fictional Chicago family that's been a pillar of black politics for generations, whose cracks, secrets, and petty dramas are, are starting to show and threaten the family. It's directed by Tony Award winner Felicia Rashad and written by Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, who show appropriate is currently killing it on Broadway. Purpose is funny and epic, and people loving it so much, the run was extended through April 28th. Luckily, tickets start at just $20 at Steppenwolf.org. That's Steppenwolf.org. Today on CityCast Chicago, we see pigeons literally everywhere, having a little lunch on CTA platforms, chilling on the side of buildings and skyscrapers. You might even go outside right now and see a bunch hanging out above your car. Yeah, you might want to go on and move that player. Now, most folks I've heard from simply think of them as rats with wings. But I've got to ask, are we really the ones giving pigeons a bad reputation we visited a Great Lakes Pigeon Rescue foster home to learn more about how they arrived in Chicago and why we should probably be a lot more empathetic. It's Thursday, April 4th. I'm Jacoby Cochran, and this is What Chicago is Talking About. I'm here with our audio producer, Michelle Navarro, and we are in Uptown with Susan Jica and Liz Challoner, uh, who are a part of the Great Lakes Pigeon Rescue. Uh, Susan, we're currently in your home. Can you tell people who may have never heard of the organization, what is the Great Lakes Pigeon Rescue? Great Lakes Pigeon Rescue was created to help the pigeons in the Chicagoland area. We found out, those of us who were interested in birds and bird rescue, that there was nowhere and no one to help the pigeons. The wildlife people couldn't, for various reasons, help them because they're not a native species. They are introduced from Europe, basically mm -hmm. northern England. And the domestic people focus on parrots and other exotic pets and really didn't want to take in the pigeons and there are so many of them yes <laughs> so we just sort of got together some like-minded people and we started reaching out to find out who could give them medical care and then the ones who are not able to be released for various reasons we find homes for them oh. so my pigeon that you're holding is a feral pigeon meaning he's a city pigeon that mm -hmm. should be able to live on the streets but he is completely blind Oh, so he was found. Somebody hey, probably buddy. scooped him up and saying, why isn't this bird flying? And our rehabber noticed he was so thin and she taught him to eat by ringing a bell. Oh, so so what would have to happen for a pigeon to end up in you all's care? I, people um, find them. I mean, I had four pigeons brought to me yesterday. They go on the internet, and then they reach out to us, and then we find somebody to transport them to one of our rehabbers or fosters. So I'm somebody that takes them in, and then I route them to the appropriate place. Is this bird releasable? Then who can give it medical care and appropriately release it? That's not just a random thing you do. There are steps to do it safely. Um, is this bird a domestic bird? I can, uh, I've got a big old king pigeon. I've got three racing pigeons that would not survive on their own. And then we get them healthy and reach out and find homes for them. At any given time, how many pigeons could your organization be caring for? We're over 600. We have a big facility out in Maple Park, Illinois, um, through wonderful, generous people have provided housing. So we have aviaries. So we have volunteers that bring the birds into their home. And just like with cat and dog rescues, those people care for the birds and they try to socialize the birds so that they are more, you know, pet friendly when, uh, when they are adopted. So we adopt out 
close to 400 pigeons a year to homes, and people love them. And I never I've knew. I've never in my entire nev- life held a pigeon. I have. I grew up in Chicago. One of the reasons we're having this conversation is because, at least in my life, alley cats and pigeons were identical to me in the sense that why are there so many? How are they surviving in this city? Like, where do they go? Where do they live? Like, how did they get here? But I... Alley cat, we've probably raised a few in my home growing up, <laughs> but a pigeon, this is the first time I've ever held one. And yet it is just the sweetest little animal. This one can't even see it. It just, it's so calm and comfortable mm-hmm. in my I've hand. I've taken them into schools. I've in one day I had 75 different middle schoolers on the south side of Chicago all take turns holding him. And he was so zen. He's not always zen at no, home. He's always. a feisty little guy. We love our, our guy. It, but so many people bring me birds. Um, and I said, do you want to come in and meet the pigeons? Because it's also a public relations thing. Yeah. People view them as dirty or pests. And they're astounded. And they'll hold my bird and they'll say, he's so beautiful. I no, mean, look the, at his the, iridescent. The yes. yeah. Just the colors on the neck. And I say, he. this is what a pigeon looks like. The hundreds of pigeons you see all have that same beauty. And... Um, You know, they're here through no fault of their own. Liz, how can you tell the difference if people are just like bringing you birds? How can you tell the difference between a domestic bird, a feral bird? How can you tell if we should release them or if we shouldn't, if they should be adopted? How how do you go through that process? Um, Key indicators of a domestic bird would be um, if it's an all the color, if it's an all white bird, that's not Um, a feral city pigeon that's not normally found in nature. If the wings are symmetric, the coloration on the wings is symmetric, that would be an indicator of something that somebody had bred for that marking. Um, If a bird is behaving in such a way that they're not afraid of you, or if they actually come up to you, and that's what we call a self-rescue. If a bird is hurt or injured or, you know, in trouble, they will actually come up to you. And and with a city pigeon, that would not be the case. They would be, if you approach them, they would typically fly away. Um, Let's see. Oh, the domestic birds, just the look. They might have feathered feet. Um, They might have kind of a little uh, crest on their head. So those would be more um, birds that would be more for show or large white pigeons, king pigeons Mm -hmm. are actually used for meat. So basically if a pigeon is looking injured or, you know, if you can catch a pigeon, that (laughs) is one we would basically want to, you know, take in and and check out. Give medical care. Correct. So we've mentioned a few times in the conversation, Susan even said it, like they are here on no fault of their own. They're not native to Chicago. And if you go around other urban centers, New York, L.A., right, the U.S., they're not native here. So can you give us a little bit of that story? How did Chicago become home? To, I don't know. What's the estimate? How many millions of pigeons in this area? So it's not just Chicago. It's every city in the world. Okay. So everywhere but Antarctica, right? So um, they were raised for food um, back in Mesopotamia times. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they were called rock doves or rock pigeons because they lived in the cliffs. Okay. And pigeons are wonderful mates and lovers and parents and they breed constantly and they were an excellent source of food so when people from europe came over they brought pigeons as a food source and the birds that escaped established themselves in the cities you will not see a pigeon like this when you're hiking the Appalachian Trail. They need people, they depend on people's detritus. They um, have made themselves at home in the underpasses and the bridges Mm -hmm. and the buildings because they mimic their natural habitat of the cliffs. Mm -hmm. So we talk about them in ancient Mesopotamian times and even as colonial forces came over to America, they were brought. But as my understanding growing up, I always had a sense that Pigeons, ravens, they also had a, a, a job to do at one point as like communicators, bringing messages from one place to the next. Is that one of the things that led to them just becoming these super smart animals? Pigeons have an innate homing sense. And that trait has been bred 
to create uh, the racing pigeons um, that are used for sport. So they're called messenger pigeons. That's another name for them. They would, as the name implies, deliver messages. Um, there was several, uh, Amer well, let's see, is it World War I, I believe? Um, also, I think in Australia, they've been used to deliver messages. And I guess scientists have not really been able to exactly identify how it works, but it does work, um, except when it doesn't. And that's how we get a lot of racing pigeon survivors, because they don't all make it home due to um, predators yeah. or weather, or rain happening. Susan, it's one thing to look out on the pigeons, to see hurt pigeons, to see how society talks about them. But how did you get to this point where you're now, you know, bringing pigeons into your home, setting people up with, you know, maybe hundreds of pigeons? Like, how does that how do you get from just identifying the problem to building a system like this? <laughs> I wish people could see it. It was just like, I ain't got no idea. It just exploded. It just I did not mean for this to happen. <laughs> I've always been a bird watcher and pigeons never interested me. And then these women and a couple of gentlemen just said, oh, help us out. Oh, sure. I, I like to help people. I like to help animals and then before i know it here we are and once i got to know the birds i began to really see how special they are they really connect with people and they're so gentle i've rescued many mostly people bring them to me i've rescued many i've never had a pigeon that i've rescued try and um be defensive, which is natural for a wild animal. You know, a dog or a cat even, you have to be very careful. A pigeon, you can just scoop up and they look almost grateful to you. I love the language choice you made there too. Not to say I've never been attacked by a pigeon, but to say a pigeon has never been defensive towards me because more times than not, we're coming up to these birds. We're trying to or any, whether save them or get any, them out the way any or any animal. animal. Exactly. Right. Yeah, I often have kids or other people, is that animal mean? I was like, no, animals aren't mean. They just are who they are. Mm -hmm. In is it possible for us to meet some? What was the name of this bird again? Okay, this bird is named Kahlo after the artist. So I had Kahlo on my hand uh, for majority of the interview until they made it very clear they didn't want to to be on my hand anymore. Now they're flapping around. Can we meet a few of your other superstars that you got here living with you? Of course. Thank you so much. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by ShipStation. If you run an e-commerce business, you know how much work it takes to produce something great while dealing with complicated shipping issues. That's why over 130,000 companies have turned to ShipStation, an innovative tool that allows you to focus less on shipping and more on building your brand. With ShipStation, you can manage orders, label printing, reporting, and customer service on one easy-to-use dashboard. You'll reduce warehouse costs with reliable enterprise solutions and save thousands on shipping costs with discounts up to 89% off. Plus, you can effortlessly import orders from everywhere you sell online. So, turn your shipping challenges into opportunities for growth. Go to ShipStation.com and use code POD to sign up for your free 60-day trial. That's ShipStation.com, code POD. All right, so now uh, Susan and Liz are going to take us into the room where the majority of the pigeons live. And I also love as we're going around, you have so much beautiful art representative of birds as well. I see herons and I don't know, I, not, and a bluebird, right? I've seen a couple pigeon pieces. Uh, I mean, it, you say that, you know, even before you had interest in the pigeon, you had interest in birds. Is this something that you track back to your childhood or? I, as a young adult, okay. then I started bird watching. Oh my God, look how big that white one is. Is that this, the, the king pigeon? This used to be my study. <laughs> <laughs> it is in some ways. I don't still. even have room for my desk lamp anymore. So, this is Sam Wise. Mm -hmm. He's. Um, he was found with two other uh, pigeons. He was probably used as a breeder for meat pigeons. Those big ones are bred for meat. They're so when people say pigeon pie, they really mean pigeon. Oh, yeah. Pigeon yeah, it's a delicacy in All some right. countries. And um, squab is served in nice restaurants. Mm -hmm. 
I would never eat it. I don't eat meat. And, you know, to me, that's like eating a puppy. I would never eat because I, I because they're so sweet. So how, how long have you known Samwise? Samwise was rescued out in the suburbs and rehabbed by wonderful Kathy Patrick. She is miraculous. And he was, I don't know if he was bald. One of his guys was bald. And, um, and then he was out in our rescue. And our rescue has met many cages. And we also have aviaries, but he, he okay. needed to be in a cage. And I was out there helping cleaning or whatever. And I go, look, he looks terrible. And they said, yeah, he's not happy here. Can you take him home? So, so Sam Wise is much happier here. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, I had him on antibiotics for a while, but he is a happy boy. He is very, very eager to have a woman, a wife. He, you should have seen him chasing this bird around last night. It was hilarious. We're looking at another <laughs> white bird. What's the name of the one down there? Uh, that's Lupita. Okay, so Sam Wise has a thing for Lupita. Yeah, but Lupita is, has no interest in Sam Wise. So he was chasing <laughs> her business, all Wise. over the place. We met the the not so positive love affair between Sam Wise and Lupita. I'm also looking at is this Shalom and Wilma? Shalom was rescued at Montrose Harbor. Okay. And she couldn't fly. And these little guys run fast. <laughs> but they they cornered her and captured her and brought her to me. And this was in August or September. So I've had her this long. She's a big, healthy racer. But she has an old break in her wing. Can you see the difference between her face and my feral pigeon, my Kahlo? Yeah, so a little bit. You like can the, look. The nose is a little. The white part of the, the nose. The slope little. of the nose is very distinct, very regal. Heavy chest muscles for flying fast. So when we get a racing pigeon, even if they're not banded or anything, we can tell this is not Those a domestic features. bird. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Come on, boo boo. Come on. Ah, look at this beauty. Wow. Oh, it looks so like a this Michelle. is probably a ceremony release bird. Oh, so like when we see like weddings or funeral. I never thought about where those birds go after they, well, they release them. In the, oh, okay. Do some of them come back? Yeah. Mm, but they weren't raised to be out there. And so right. they're easy so, picking so for predators. What, and, yeah, what the business person will probably tell you, you know, they have the fancy basket and the ribbons and the birds fly and they're beautiful. Oh, they'll come back. They'll be safe. But pigeons are so expendable because they, they, they have babies so every often. month. Yeah. But something to include is this ceremony release stuff is brutal. I have had them literally die in my arms from starvation. I, I it's It just makes me weep. Um, I'm glad you so, mentioned that. That's yeah. something to consider. And then a couple of others I see, um, Valentino uh, is right next to Wilma. What are some of the distinctions between these so, two? So, all right, you tell me. Which one is a feral and which one is a racer? All right, off back, I think Wilma. No, hold on. Because actually, as I look at Valentino, Wilma's nose is a little bit more regal, but Valentino's chest seems, I don't know. I'm going to say Wilma's the racer. That You're posture right. seems really strong. That You're chest right. seems like they've just been standing very, very good. strong, stoic, and with a good posture the whole time <laughs> we've been here. Valentino yeah. kind of been chilling, kind He's of looking around, kind of looking down. He has um, neurological damage. Mm. So basically brain damage, I suppose, probably from a collision. See how he's looking up? We yeah. call that stargazing. But he is a riot. He has got personality. <laughs> I hope he gets adopted soon. So he, so last night I had all the birds out because I wanted to do a big cleaning. Can't tell now, but I really <laughs> cleaned <laughs> How often do you have to clean up after them? Our producer, Simone, told us that they are not like, you know, humans. We can hold it. They kind of just use the bathroom. And that's, use the bathroom. Why, that's why they have pants on when they walk around the house. Oh. Didn't you notice the birds sitting on you had I pants did. on? I did. Yeah. I thought it was a bib. Those were pants. Yeah, they were diapers. Nice. Yeah, Flipers. yeah. Flipers, Flipers is what we call them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, this is, this is her... Her diaper. We get her from Bev's Bird Boutique. She does an excellent job. <laughs> and I mean, uh, Kahlo's got a tuxedo. I mean, they have really cute designs. Mm -hmm. Now that you're seeing that these flippers, 
Mm-hmm. Exist. I am being more and more convinced yeah, more and more sway. that maybe I need a pigeon at home. Michelle's been saying for the longest that this was going to be something that pushes her. She has a little deck. She was like, maybe I could do something out there. I don't. I cannot stop staring at Wilma. This posture she made is the so strong. Front page of the Tribune. Okay. She was it, above the fold on the Tribune. That photographer so, must have taken a thousand pictures. It's so <laughs> steel and so strong. And so if I'm in the street and I see like a pigeon like this, like how do racer pigeons that are out in the wild, how do they make it? Do they just develop those skills? Is it luck? Like how would a, a strong bird like Wilma kind of survive out there? She wouldn't. She'd she get wouldn't. eaten by a hawk. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Or run over by a car. They don't have any of those skills. Mm. Yeah. It, Six months a year, if they're lucky. So most of the pigeons we see out on the street, while there may have a few domestic ones thrown in, but they're likely to get weeded out because these pigeons have just had to survive the streets of Chicago. I mean, when we think of, again, animals that sort of just live on our city streets, so much goes beyond sort of just what their species is. It goes back how we think about them, right? We were talking with the person in city government responsible for sort of cleaning up the rats in Chicago. And they talk about rats in some ways like villains. When we talk about cats, right, we're a little more empathetic to cats. So if we look at the numbers, the ecological damage they do to other species is nuts. But then the pigeon, it's one that we just sort of like treat as we dismiss. We kind of walk over. We look at it as dirty. Susan, why is it important for us to to challenge that narrative a little bit, to, to see them as the sort of vulnerable, but also beautiful creatures they are. Mm, I like how you said that. Um, I, I think it is always a good thing to be kind. And, and that's what we need to do is to be kind to the creatures we share this earth with. And like, and, and I understand that overpopulation of pigeons around certain buildings, it it's not a good thing. So, but there are kind ways to try and work on solving that. So that's, that's what I think. And, and pigeons are intelligent. They saved thousands of lives during World War One and World War Two. I mean, using their homing instincts, they bond with people. So, um, there's there's nothing bad about them. They're just trying to, <laughs> just trying to, to live their life. Day day. Yeah. <laughs> now I know moving forward, I probably will not look at them the same. I'm gonna be trying to spot a Wilma moving forward. But for folks listening to this podcast, and because the city isn't responsible and some of the animal care orgs aren't responsible, if I see that I can't, oh, I mean I could, but I'm not gonna just pick it up and take it home. So what should be my my first call to action? Pick it up and take it home. (laughs) So, but yeah, I mean, if you're comfortable, just scoop that baby up, tuck it under your arm like a football, right? (laughs) No cage, just a box, paper towels, quiet, Okay. and somebody will be in touch pretty quickly. Okay. I would encourage people to have an open mind when it comes to pigeons, and uh, before you disdain them offhand, I would encourage you to take a minute and appreciate the beauty of them. And if possible, help one, rescue one, come meet one of us. And I think it might be mind changing. And also another myth that we need to challenge is that they are not disease ridden. Okay. You can pick up a pigeon safely, just use appropriate hand hygiene like you would any other situation do they not because at least when i think of feral animals if i just sort of package everybody together my first thought is rabies i don't want rabies from a raccoon or a cat or do pit can pigeons carry rabies no i i don't know what percentage but most of their illnesses they would have are not zoonotic they do not they don't cross from... species mm-hmm. so i mean yeah i mean you do have to use appropriate hygiene but yeah, i've handled hundreds of pigeons and sometimes I forget to wash my hands. <laughs> so you have gone from no li- little to no interest to starting an organization to caring for them in your home. What is it about them that you have just you've fallen so in love with over this time? It, they're vulnerable and there is no one else for them. I guess that's what it is. I mean, Liz, Liz does a ton of rescue, and without her, our organization couldn't function. So, I mean, how? 
I mean, you spend all this time. I, I mean, I did not love pigeons to begin with. So I'm a great example of somebody who did open their mind and, you know, gave it a uh, different, more consideration and realized. And then that kind of morphed into the pigeon rescuing. And um, now I just, that's pretty much what I do. So I don't have any pigeons. I live in an apartment uh, where the landlord does not allow pets. So um, she brings them to me. Yes. <laughs> what is your ability in the city of Chicago to have or not have a pigeon? There's actually an ordinance against owning pigeons, and it was to prevent people from having lofts and raising great amounts. Mm -hmm. And they don't prevent people from having a reasonable number of pets. Okay. I mean, this is a lot, but these birds don't stay, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, and I'm clean and and pigeons are quiet, yes. except for my little bird that coos all the time. But <laughs> not, most of them are quiet. They're not destructive like parrots are. They don't chew on things. They're really quite a wonderful. If somebody wants a bird as a pet, they're wonderful. And also they've been domesticated for 10,000 years. Unlike the parrots, though they might be captive bred, it is still in their DNA to be wild. Yeah. And it's not in the pigeons. They, they adjust great. I'll have, since I have so many, I don't spend a lot of time socializing them. And I'll have birds that are a little bit, oh, they're kind of scared of people. And then the adopter will get them. Like, like Gandalf was like that. Gandalf was great. He used to be in that cage there. What a beautiful and name. I know. He was this beautiful gray. And um, he was great. He would dance for you. And um, as soon as the adopter got him, he got cuddly. He was never cuddly with me. So when they get their people and they bond with them, it's special. I think this guy's going to be special. He, he dances a little bit. Well, Michelle, keep your Valentino. eye Valentino. And I like the name Valentino. No, that's no, fine. It's, it's fun coming up with names. Yeah. yeah. You got to let us know when you when you name this little one down yeah. here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was thinking my guide in Tanzania was named Promise. So I'm thinking of that name. But I'm thinking he was a, he is a very special person so maybe i'm wait till i get a real fancy pigeon for promise well, um, it was very clear susan you have made a promise to all of the pigeons yeah. you come in contact with to take care of them to rescue them and to make sure that they can live as long healthy lives as possible it has been an absolute pleasure i want to thank susan and i want to thank liz again for making time for city cash chicago thank, thank you, you so it was our pleasure Before I let you go, get the latest news and events by bookmarking our website, chicago.citycast.fm. And if you'd like to get those things directly in your inbox every morning, Monday through Friday, then subscribe to our daily newsletter, Hey Chicago. I know what you're here for. Some good news. First Thursdays of the month mean it's time for the Big Kids Variety Show hosted at Dorian's and Wicker Park. Sign up for the open mic starts promptly at 8. The show begins at 9 and tickets are just $10. And since it's National Poetry Month, I got a feeling this show going to be extra special. Check the show notes for more information. As always, I appreciate you for making time. I'm going to be back bright and early tomorrow morning, breaking down some key stories from the week but also talking about two of the most highly anticipated books coming out of Chicago this spring. We'll talk to you then. Peace. What you're hearing in the back is the beautiful cuddling sound of the local pigeon.